So welcome everyone. We have a few more people probably coming in in just a moment. I'm going to, let's see. I'd like to mute everyone. If you're not already muted, we're going to mute you. And we are going to audio mute you as well. Uh, video and audio mute. <laughs> but thank you for joining us. We are really thrilled to have all of you joining us tonight for this program. So tonight we're going to talk about plants, house plants for health. And Jane is going to be our speaker. But first, I'd like to introduce our, our host for the evening is uh, Napa County Library. And Stefana Pramik is here from the Napa Library. So if you want to welcome everybody, Stefana. Great. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, it's a pleasure to partner with the UC Master Gardeners in this monthly series. Um, each month, as I learn about gardening and plant care, uh, I appreciate more and more the depth of knowledge that our Napa County Master Gardeners have. The presenters, they've gone through a rigorous program and they work hard developing and pre presenting extensive programming to our community. And I'm delighted that we're able to meet through these Zoom meetings, but I do look forward to when we can again meet in the community meeting room at the Napa County Library. So, um, Thank you so much to Yvonne and to all the volunteers for all the hard work that you do to bring these programs to our community. All right, Yvonne. Thanks, Stefna. Um, yeah, we're, we are so thrilled to partner with the library. They, they are fantastic partners with us to host us. And when we're in person, I know it's always lovely to use their meeting room. And for a while we'll be doing this, but as we uh, hopefully we'll get back to regular in-person meetings pretty soon. So before we get too far, I'd like to just introduce you to the Master Gardeners. We are a volunteer organization, and I know many of you have been to our programs before. We do all kinds of public education on home gardening, and our purpose really is to extend the wonderful UC research-based information out to the public and to really focus on helping home gardeners be more successful. Our program tonight is really fun because it's a little it's a little beyond just growing plants, but talking also all the, about all the great things that plants do for us as well. We're very excited this year for uh, celebrating our 25th anniversary. So the UC Master Gardeners of Napa County have been in Napa for 25 years. So this is a statewide program. There are Master Gardener programs in almost every county in California and Napa County has been going for 25 years. And I've been here 23 of those 25, so almost the whole time. We have a wonderful website that you can go to and find out about all of our programs and resources. We will sh uh, record this event tonight and we will post it there in the next couple of weeks. And all of the resources and slideshow will be available as well. So you can go and check that out. And one more comment. If you have any questions as we're going through the program, please type them into the chat. You can find the chat usually at the bottom or the top of your screen, there's a little icon for chat. And if you type in your questions as you go, we'll do the presentation. And then towards the end, we're going to do um, Q&A time. And you can type questions as we go along. And then at the end, we'll answer those for you. So I'm going to turn it over now to Jane, who's going to be our speaker. So go ahead, Jane. OK, thank you, Yvonne. And thank you, everybody, for joining. Um, welcome. I know you could be watching football or um, you could be watching Jeopardy. So I, I appreciate you tuning in this evening. Um, before we get um, started in talking about House Plants for Health, um, I want to start with a little poll that Yvonne is going to launch for us. And what this uh, is a poll is to talk about um, SAD. It's an acronym. And are you familiar with this acronym? And if so, um, do you know what the letters stand for? Uh, is it soil and abiotic disease? Start acclimating directly, seasonal affective disorder, or seasonal abscission disorder? So you take just a, a second there and uh, respond. Appreciate it. Looks like everybody's voted. So let me share the results of what, what they said. Okay. So it looks like most of you have heard of um, SAD, Seasonal Affective Disorder. Um, and so that's some of the things we're gonna be talking about tonight is um, 
and that would be the next slide. Thank you, Yvonne. Um, the, what some folks refer to as the um, winter blues. And um, according to a YouGov survey, over half of adults say their overall mood is worse in the winter. And um, seasonal affective disorder is actually a type of uh, seasonal moodiness and, um, and in some cases, a mild depression. It tends to affect some of us when the seasons change and when summer wanes and we have less daylight hours. Um, and it's normally a, it's caused actually by less sunlight and some folks are, are definitely affected by that. As November begins and we have less daylight hours, we may tend to be outdoors less. Maybe we're not in our gardens, out in the parks or, or hiking and we spend less time out of doors. You can find yourself getting a little lethargic, maybe less energy, maybe experiencing insomnia or moodiness. Um, and so what we're finding is that there are ways to offset some of those winter blues. And that's what we're gonna talk about tonight. And that is how houseplants can play a part in that. And I, I got to know a little bit about seasonal affective disorder um, from a, a, an experience with my one son is he, he has suffered from seasonal affective disorder. And um, we thought it was just teenage angst, but then as we um, explored it for further, we started to realize, no, he really does have, um, um, is affected by the seasonal changes. Um, ironically, he moved to Seattle, but as an adult, he has learned how to um, compensate for that seasonal change. So tonight we're gonna to talk about the health benefits of houseplants, um, how houseplants can benefit us, and then we'll talk a little bit about how we can help houseplants, the, how to keep our houseplants healthy. And then we're gonna have some question and answers. So houseplants for health. Um, houseplants, um, I always had houseplants in my house when I was growing up. My parents um, were well into houseplants. My mother was a big um, um, fan of African violets. And my father actually set up a, um, growing area in the basement with grow lights. Grew up in Pennsylvania, so he would bring in many plants from um, outdoors that had summered outdoors and bring them in for the summer or for the winter, I should say, and keep them alive under grow lights. And he also liked to propagate plants. And so I've been around house plants most of my life. So tonight when we go through the slide, you'll see that I've taken some photos from various sources and my photos are from copyright free photo places. So houseplants do help boost our mental well-being. They also um, help clean our, some of the benefits there also help clean our indoor air. Uh, plants releasing oxygen, they add moisture to the indoor environment. Plants have, houseplants have been heard, found to reduce stress um, and um, they actually provide a sense of accomplishment. And just like stress um, uh, can be helped with pets. Houseplants have also been found and that's because taking care of um, a pet or a plant helps you to refocus your energy. And then lastly, um, houseplants can make room, a room look more inviting. So um, in preparing for the library talk, I did some reading on horticulture therapy and found it actually very interesting. And I like this quote, and this was from a book called uh, Nature Green, The Meaning of Plants in Our Lives. And uh, it's by Charles A. Lewis. And the quote is, horticulture therapy is rooted in the fact that plants and people share the same rhythm of life. Plants like people grow and change and both respond to nurturing and to outside influences. And caring for plants helps to offer an emotional health and creative expression. And they actually just remind us of our link to nature. And in, um, whoops. Oh, you soon? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> um, I think the next slide. Okay. <laughs> 
Oops, I think we've lost. That's a different one. Okay, we we'll go to. Slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's that's okay. Let me talk a little bit more about the horticulture therapy because I found it very interesting. Um, because horticulture therapy is uh, combines both the art and science of working with plants, and working with soil and plants has been found to be very therapeutic and helpful and powerful in helping the process of healing from both serious mental and physical problem, health problems. And it's, it's because through working with the plant care, the horticulture therapists have found that it helps the patient move from a caregiving role um, to um, a role where they're not focusing on themselves, they're focusing on uh, another object, in this case, the plant. And being the object of care has shown to offer life-affirming perspectives for that patient. So they, they do offer a powerful, um, very, very powerful for a, um, healing. And plants, as, as this slide shows, also help our indoor air. And um, perhaps you've heard of um, sick building syndrome. And um, in sick building syndrome, this is uh, our modern energy efficient homes are pretty airtight and the concentration of air pollutants from our furnishings can build up to levels that, that can pose a threat to our health. And plants absorb pollutants through their leaves and roots. Um, and they re research has shown that rooms with house plants actually contain 60% less airborne molds and bacteria than rooms without any greenery. And also uh, house plants have been found to absorb some of the common household toxins Certain house plants have been found to help absorb uh, compounds such as the, the toxins that are coming off things such as paint, cleaning supplies, textiles, and floor coverings. And for example, the pothos that's up there in the left-hand corner, um, the golden pothos has been found to help remove benzene, formaldehyde, and triethylene, trichloroethylene. So they do help clean our air. You know, houseplants also help to add humidity to our dry indoor winter air. Our, our homes can get pretty dry during the winter and plants can help increase the humidity through um, evapotranspiration. And that's when the water from the soil makes its way up through the roots of the plant and through the stems and up to the leaves where it evaporates into the air through the pores in the leaves called stomato. And increasing the humidity in your home is a benefit to you. And that's because it's an aid in your respiratory system. And it actually promotes clean, um, clean human air actually promotes um, healthy skin. So nearly all plants um, offer some type of humidity, but plants with broad leaves provide a greater humidi humidifying effect. So plants such as uh, Dracaena, philodendron or peace, peace lily have been found to be very helpful in adding humidity. And then plants also um, interestingly help enhance our cognitive skills. And um, again, in preparing, preparing for the, the talk, I read a number of studies. And according to a study conducted by Texas A&M University, keeping potted plants and flowers around your workplace actually can help improve your creative performance and improve solve, problem solving skills. And then another study done by Exeter University in the UK found that indoor plants improve concentration, productivity, and they help boost staff well being by 47%. And just being around plants has also been shown to increase memory retention by up to 20%. So they're very beneficial for us. And then plants have been found to aid in the healing process. Um, being in close proximity to plants can help you feel calm. Um, they help you to heal faster from injuries. And again, another study I found um, through Kansas State University recommends that potted plants and flowers um, can be used as a non-invasive, inexpensive and effective complementary medicine for surgical patients. Um, and studies led by Texas A&M University have suggested that horticulture therapy can help patients in health facilities. So it's not just our mental well-being, it's actually our physical well-being 
Um, plants are a great companion for us. And then uh, for those of us that might be feeling stress right now, uh, plants have been found to help reduce stress. Um, and why is that? It, it's part of it is just that caring for plants um, and even gardening helps us be present in the moment. Um, according to a study published in the Journal of Physiological Anthropology, um, active interaction with indoor plants, such as touching or smelling them, can reduce physiological and psychological stress. So help, they help us be in the moment and help us ground, focusing on caring for your plants helps you to be present and in the moment. And plants have actually been found to um, help you feel um, powerful because focusing on your plants um, and caring for your plants helps to ground you. And it provides us perspective on how the little things in life can make an impact and we can make a difference. Um, for those of you that have house plants or or enjoy gardening, I'm sure you felt a reward when you've seen a plant um, respond to your, your care and it helps you understand that you can make a difference. And plants have actually been shown to um, affect the brain's electrical activity. And this was kind of interesting. Whoops, there you go. Um, it also been established that plants confer positive change in the brain's electrical activity muscle tension and heart activity. And that was something I read about in an online magazine called The Conversation, which had some interesting articles. And then studies have also been found, um, have shown that there is a connection between indoor plants and the healing process um, for hospital patients. Another study that I read about talked about um, having plants in the hospital rooms um, actually found to uh, cause lower blood pressure for patients. Um, they had a higher pain tolerance when there were plants in the room, lower anxiety, lower, fan, uh, and lower fatigue. Um, and this study, again, supports the therapeutic power of plants. And then Beyond just the mental health um, benefits and the physical health benefits, plants can, house plants can help us make a room feel more inviting. They can improve acoustics and reduce noise. Um, they help add color to a room. They can create a focal point or soften a corner. Um, some folks, you know, they just want to put some potted plants like some herbs in the kitchen um, for culinary purposes or just to add a focal point for the kitchen. And some people like to add one or two plants here or there, while others prefer to have many plants and group them. And um, this picture that I included here, it shows how just adding a few plants to a window uh, sill with some books adds a nice focal point for that room. And um, you can play with how you want to use your plants, you know, per perhaps adding a focal point by Putting a plant on top of a, a bookcase can add height to, to the room. Um, or you can even use plants as a room divider. So regardless of how you use your house plants, we've now talked about how um, beneficial they are for you, um, both mentally and physically. OK, there's a lot on this slide. Um, but let's talk a little bit about now that we've talked about how plants can benefit us. Um, let's talk about how you take care of your house plants. And a couple of things, it's always important to have the plant, the right plant in the right place. And that's kind of a mantra for us in the Master Gardener organization. And some things to consider is that before you go out and buy, purchase a plant, um, understand its native origin. Um, most house plants come from the tropics or the subtropics. Uh, of course, some come from deserts like succulents or cactus. So you want to know the plants required growing conditions before you buy or bring it home from your friends or your friend says, here's a plant for you, take it home. Um, light requirements are really important. This is probably one of the most important factors for healthy plant house plants. 
because light's necessary for plants. Um, it helps, it's their energy source for creating photosynthesis. And the sunniest location in a home is most likely less light than a shady location outside, which I found was kind of interesting. Uh, so when considering where are you gonna put the plant, think about the intensity of the light and the duration of that, that it, the light. Um, houseplants can be classified in uh, general light requirements, uh, very high, high, medium, and low. And low light location, locations are about six feet from the window and receive no direct light. And then a medium light location are areas roughly three to six feet from uh, the window of a east, west, or south facing window. And then a high light location would just be three feet from the window, again, a south, east, or west window. But generally speaking, uh, plants look at better and grow better with medium or, or light or high heat than insufficient heat. I'm not sorry, so not heat, but light. And as for duration, you want to think about the light the plant will receive in a 24 hour period. A plant in a sunny south facing window for a period of time or during the most intense sun of the day could easily uh, suffer from sunburn. And so you want to consider where you're going to put that plant. Also consider that for low intensity, for a long period of time, that will determine how much water that plant is going to be using. So let's talk about water. Um, interestingly, water is the most common way we kill our house plants. It's actually better to err on the side of underwatering. So if it's a leafy plant, let it dry out mostly between, between your waterings. And if it's a succulent, you want to let it dry out uh, completely between waterings. And how much or how often actually depends on several things. It's the type of plant, um, the light intensity, the temperature in the home, air circulation, uh, the container or the container mix. And also consider that you know, some indoor plants have a dormancy period. Um, generally speaking, when you're ready to water, you want to water the, um, when the top one inch of soil is dry. And the best way to check on that is take your index finger and stick it in the soil to a one or two inch depth and feel the soil for moisture. If, this, if the soil feels damp, don't water. And then when you do water, you want to water until a little water runs out the bottom of the pot. And this helps um, for a couple things. It helps remove any salts or residue that has built up in the soil. And it also ensures that the pot and root system is wet. So some folks say, well, what kind of water? Well, I personally use tap water that I've allowed to sit out for 24 hours, and that helps let the chlorine dissipate. But some experts say to use only distilled water. Um, I, I have had success with tap water, so I haven't moved to distilled water. But be sure that you use a room temperature water. And temperature. As we mentioned, um, houseplants come from both tropical and subtropical areas, and so they don't tolerate cold temperatures. Um, they do well in the normal temperatures that we find in households. Um, the plants actually benefit from a nighttime temperature that is about 10 to 15 degrees uh, cooler at night and because this induces a physiological recovery from moisture loss. So never um, place a plant on a warm appliance. I know when I was growing up, we had those big TVs in the cabinets. My mom used to put plants on top of the TV, but it's probably not a good idea. Um, you want to avoid high or low temperatures. And air circulation is actually um, good and beneficial for the plants because it helps to simulate, <clears throat> excuse me, outdoor um, environments. And it actually helps make the plant a little sturdier. But don't put your plant in front of a forced air vent or directly in the path of a door that's going to have a cold air draft. We talked before about humidity, how the 
humidity that the plants add to our indoor environments are helpful for us. Well, plants need humidity too. And sometimes it's difficult for us to control the humidity in our homes and apartments. Um, but if you normally have dry or very low humidity in your home, you can consider adding a humidifier to your heating or ventilation system. But if that's not possible, um, simply grouping plants together or placing them on pebbles or gravel on the trays under the plant with a bit of moisture is going to help with, with the humidity for the plant. You know, I've heard over the years, some people say that they mist or spray their plants, but actually research has shown that doesn't significantly affect the humidity for the plant. And in preparing for the, the talk, I actually read about folks who give their plants a Sunday night bath with all the plants grouped together in the bathtub or shower. I personally haven't tried that. And I think that there's pros and cons to that idea. And then finally, I think that it's important to consider your habitat and your needs when you're thinking of adding a plant. Um, I personally enjoy taking the time in the morning once a week to tend my plants. Um, it's a time I set aside for me uh, to tend my plants while I enjoy a cup of coffee. Um, I embrace that time because it takes away from other chores. And it's also a time for me to concentrate on my plants. Um, I try to spend time looking at them and dedicating my focus to them. Um, it's a good time to observe to see if there's any pests or anything else that's going on with those plants. So before you jump into house plants or um, just thinking of adding house plants, consider your home environment. We talked this evening about some of that environment and some of your needs as well. So is your home able to accommodate the needs of this plant? Do you have small children or animals that you need to consider before adding another plant or plants to your environment? And although we're, we've all been housebound more lately because of the COVID situation, do you normally travel a lot? And if so, who will tend your plants while you're away? So those are some things as well to consider um, about our house plants. The next one, oh, oops, oh, so oh. we have the wrong slide. Oh, sorry, here. Jane, we have the wrong slide shows. I apologize. Okay, here we go. Here we are. Um, so common household problems. Let's talk about some things that can go wrong with um, plants. Um, I think it's worth talking about containers. So there's some things I'd like to cover on that. Um, and some of it's because of mistakes I've made. Um, avoid putting a plant in a container that's too large for the size of its root system. Um, when transplanting, don't cho choose a container that's more than one inch larger than the previous pot. Um, and that's something I did. Um, I found a pot that I really liked and I was determined to get that plant into that pot. You want about a one inch gap between the roots and the inside of the pot because otherwise you're gonna end up with too much soil for the plant and the roots will not be able to remove the water from the soil. And then you're gonna end up with a waterlogged plant. And that sets up a situation or a condition for bacteria, fungus and root diseases. Um, the containers should be large enough for you to provide room for soil and roots and then offer enough room at the top of the pot to water. In other words, you don't want to fill it all the way to the brim with the soil. And use a container that has drainage holes. If you have a decorative pot that you want to use and it doesn't have drainage holes, use it as a sleeve to hold the actual pot with the drainage holes. And uh, keep in mind that you should sterilize old formerly used pots before using. And you can sterilize your old pots with um, household bleach diluted one to nine with water and then rinse thoroughly. And soil, let's talk about soil. Um, don't use field or garden soil. Um, you wanna use potting soil that's designed specifically for plants growing in containers. Um, potting soils are developed uh, specifically with higher concentrations of bulky organic matter. So when you're looking for soil, you want to choose a commercial potting soil that's high in bark, forest materials, uh, sphagnum peat, and perlite or vermiculite. And um, again, uh, um, an old myth is that 
some folks think that you should add a number of other items like charcoal or gravel or other coarse texture to the pot. Um, that's actually a myth because it actually doesn't do anything to help the drainage in the pot. It actually can impede the drainage um, rather than help. And then um, fertilizer. Um, plants, indoor plants need fertilizer um, with the three major uh, nutrients, um, nitrogen, the N, uh, phosphorus, P, and potassium, K. And I'm always little concerned about over fertilizing houseplants versus under fertilizing. So you wanna follow the directions on the package um, and then maybe consider even diluting even further because over fertilizing can kill the plant and cause a buildup <clears throat> of salts in your soil. And how much fertilizer? Well, it depends. Um, for example, African violets can be given low level fertilizer with every watering to encourage blossoms. But other house plants may only need fertilizer once or twice a year. So again, it's really important to know your plant and its needs. Next slide, Yvonne. Okay, okay. Um, there's a lot on this slide. Um, some things I wanna point out though, but before we get further talking about the slides, um, I, I think it's really important to pay attention to your plants. Um, keeping them clean is about the best and easiest way to control pests. Um, with a small potted plant, you can easily um, clean that over at the sink. Whereas if you have a large potted plant that's gonna require heavy lifting and moving to the out of doors or a tub to adequately clean, you wanna think that about that and how you're going to do that. And I say that because it's easy to walk into a plant store or a greenhouse and say, oh my gosh, I love that huge ficus. Um, and then not think about how you're going to care for it at home. Um, so first, before you buy a plant, always inspect it for pests. Um, you want to thoroughly inspect it for pests by carefully um, inspecting the undersides of the leaves for things like mites or insects and possible diseases. And don't purchase a sick plant thinking that you're going to be able to bring it back to health. Um, you don't want to get um, something home that is going to not respond to your care. So you want to avoid plants that look spindly, have yellow spots, chlorotic leaves or brown leaf margins or that are wilted or waterlogged. So you just look at the plant and the plant should have good color and young leaf growth. And then when you do bring a new plant into your home, you wanna isolate the new plant before you introduce it to the rest of the plants in your house. Um, observe it for pests or possible root diseases. And I recommend that also for plants, you know, those of you of us that have house plants and we, we sometimes put them out on the shaded patio for the summer. Before you bring them back in the house at the end of the season, um, you wanna inspect them, um, make sure your ants haven't taken over the pot or um, there's any other critters that could be um, hiding on the plant. And when you do bring it in, be sure to isolate it from your other plants for a little bit, sometimes up through a couple of weeks. So back to this, um, this particular slide, um, a couple of things. I'm not gonna go through every symptom, but there is something I wanna point out on the, the um, if you look at the symptoms on the left and the possible causes on the right. I talked earlier about that overwatering is the most common way we kill houseplants. And if you look at the symptoms on the left and the possible causes on the right, you're gonna see that in each of those boxes, overwatering, is a possibility. And it's often um, an abiotic situation, and something that we have done that is gonna cause the plant to, to not respond or, or um, not be well. Um, so you wanna consider your, um, your things such as overwatering, underwatering, uh, too much light, um, not enough light. Uh, temperatures, uh, again, are, as we talked about earlier, are really important. Um, and air, is it dry air in the home? Maybe you need to add a little humidity. Um, and how is that your care affecting the root system? So those are some things I really wanted to pour not, point out on that particular slide. Overwatering is often the most common way we kill our houseplants. 
and this is an example of a plant you could take a look at and say, gee, which one is overwatered and which one is underwatered? Um, they have some similarities. They have the brown tips, uh, leaf tips um, on both of those plants, and they don't, both plants are not responding well. They look, don't look well. Um, so the one on the right, um, the peace lily, is um, underwatered. And the, the plant on the left, the ZZ plant, is actually overwatered. So there's some other things to consider as well. If you look at the, the plant on the left with the, take a look at the stems, they're elongated. Um, that might also indicate that the plant is not getting enough um, light. And so if, again, as we talked earlier, if a plant is in a dim lo um, light location, low light location, it's not going to need as much water. Uh, so you have to consider the growing conditions of that plant um, in de determining how much water it needs. Um, again, the peace lily on the right, a good way to determine if it uh, needs water, stick your finger in the, in the soil, again, to a one to two inch index, your index finger to one to two inch depth and see um, if it needs some water. And I like that um, slide. Okay, let's talk a little bit about pests that you might encounter on your house plants. Um, in two um, slides here, or two photos here. The one on the left um, is an example of a spider mite infestation. And um, spider mite infestations can take place again in a home that is pretty dry air conditioning, you know, dry atmosphere. Um, and maybe it's a little dusty. The plant's been allowed to dry out, um, making it more susceptible. Or again, you could have brought it into the house on, on another plant. Um, what you're going to notice is the tiny speckling on the leaves. Um, the leaves get a bronzed look. Um, and you can see in that one photo on the left there, a bit of webbing and that you might see that at the growing points. And spider mite infestations actually can be handled without pesticide if you catch them early. Um, and you might wanna consider taking a spray bottle and putting um, some low amount of um, dish soap in it or hand soap, liquid soap and, um, and water, and then really douse the plant well, spraying it all over, trying to get those little critters um, and let it set for just a little bit, not very long, and then rinse it off. Um, you do have to keep on top of it. It's not something that's once and done. You'll have to keep an eye on it. Um, but that might be something better that, to try that before you resolve to any type of pesticide. And the photo on the right is an example of mealybug. And you can get those on your houseplants as well. You do normally see them on the back side of the plant or the leaf, I should say. You can also see them down in the, the, the branch area, the crotch of the plant, and even down closer to the soil sometimes. And you wanna catch those uh, pretty quickly because they can um, be rather damaging to your plant. And uh, again, another way that you can control those without pesticides is to, with a Q-tip, use a combination of um, 70% al isopropyl alcohol with water, diluted with a little water, and then individually um, with the Q-tip, remove the mealybugs. And it's gonna take some time and you're going to have to stay on top of it. Um, but again, if you're inspecting, you're taking care of your plants and you're inspect inspecting them pretty regularly, you'll probably stay on top of it. If you do have to resort to um, a pesticide, I would recommend a neem oil or um, insecticidal soap. And um, if you're going to be using a pesticide, don't do it inside your home, take it outside. And also keep in mind, don't hesitate to call the help desk. Uh, the Master Gardener Help Desk is here to help you with your plants, both indoor and out. Um, so be sure to call us. And the, um, this graph that, you're, that I shared with you or the table is from the UC site. The UC Davis site has an excellent um, information on houseplants. So you just on Google houseplants UC and you're gonna find a lot of information. Okay, some plants that are easy to grow. 
uh, thought we would we thought we would add some of you if you're new to taking care of house plants these are some plants that are easy to grow um a dracaena a dracaena um they tolerate normal household conditions um you want to avoid overwatering them because they don't like wet roots even though they are subtropical um and i learned that um i was watering my dracaena and it's a, a pretty good sized plant and i poured my water through just as I, I said to you, I like to make sure it comes out the bottom of the plant. But at the same time, my um, two-year-old grandson was visiting and um, it was time to go to the park. Um, so went out the door, came back a couple hours later and I looked at my plant and lo and behold, the water, the plant had been sitting in a fair amount of water in the tray. And so um, I was able to absorb that water and get it out of there. But what I noticed about um, a week or two later is I started to have leaf drop um, because they just don't like wet roots. Um, the plant is fine now. And what I also did was add pebbles on underneath in the tray to help absorb any um, moisture should I attempt <laughs> over water again. And then I, the other plant I've shown here is the philodendron. And I included the, the big leaf or the large leaf um, philodendron. And that's because I think it's such a beautiful plant. But philodel, phil, philodendrons come in um, varying, various sizes. They come in a smaller size too, um, with a little, almost like a heart-shaped leaf. Um, and it's a trailing plant. And they're easy to grow and they also prefer dry conditions. The cast iron plant, um, just as the name implies, it's almost indestructible. Um, it's hardy and it's slow growing. I personally have not grown a cast iron plant, but you do see them um, both indoors and outdoors in California um, because they can they grow outdoors easily in California. And then there's the Chinese evergreen. Um, that performs well even in a dim light situation. And we talked earlier about the pothos. Um, it's um, a plant that it's a lot of people say, oh, the pothos, everybody has a pothos. But I personally like pothos. They're a nice plant to add some color to a certain to an area. Um, they're very hardy. They have the trailing growth pattern. Um, and I remember back in the 70s um, wasn't unusual to go to a dorm room or to someone's apartment and you would see somebody had a pothos with a trailing plant all the way across the room. And you know you can cut them um, off that trailing and propagate pretty easily as well. And then the snake plant that's also known as the mother-in-law tongue and it prefers a dry condition as well. And um, what I have found with plants that prefer dry conditions is that it's helpful to mark on your calendar when you watered it last. And that's because uh, something like a mother-in-law tongue um, in, in uh, a normal household conditions can probably go three weeks without being needed to water. So if I have a plant that prefers dry conditions and all my other plants require weekly watering, I have to mark it on the calendar otherwise I won't forget, I won't remember to water it. Um, but again, the best way to test it is to feel it with your finger to see if it needs some water. Okay, um, we're coming up on the holidays and um, giving someone a house plant is often a nice gift, especially if you know their, their household environment and if you know they, they're able to take care of house plants and these are some uh, resources for um, buying houseplants in the Napa Valley. Um, Down Valley, we have an American Canyon Mid-City nurse Nursery. Um, they have a nice selection and they're pretty, pretty uh, knowledgeable on plants. And Napa and Osh in the Bel Air Shopping Center. And then Riza is a new botanical boutique on, in downtown Napa on First Street. Um, they have a nice selection and um, it's actually owned by a master gardener, uh, Alyssa. And then um, Van Winden's with their greenhouse, they have uh, quite a selection of houseplants, both large houseplants and small houseplants. And then Up Valley is Central Valley Hardware. So 
now that you know the happiness and benefits that houseplants can bring you and what you can do to keep your houseplants alive, um, I'll turn it back to Yvonne. Thank you for joining this evening. And um, we'll turn it over to Yvonne and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you, Jane. And I apologize, I had grabbed some of the wrong slides on here, but um, this is a wonderful resource references that Jane used. I don't know if these are all the ones she used, but some of the best ones that she found. This reference list will be on our website after the program. And um, there's, there's a lot of books in here and I'm sure the library has some of these, so you can use that resource as well. Again, this slideshow and presentation will be posted on our website in the next week or so. Um, and this is our website again, the napamg.ucanr.edu, but you can also just search for UC Master Gardeners Napa County and you'll find our website. And now it's open for any questions you might have. I, I posted here the Napa County Library website as well because they also have wonderful resources and I know they're open again for people to come in and borrow books, but you can also do it online. So um, we will now open it up to any questions, if anybody has any questions. Looks like we have one on the chat. Oh, great, okay. And it says, do we need uh, to get potting soil for indoor plants? Yes, that's recommended. Um, a good uh, commercial grade uh, potting soil is good. Just as I mentioned, it has the the, um, the the material within the house plant within the soil that the plants need, the bark, um, some sphagnum moss built into it, and um, perlite or vermiculite. So I would recommend that you do use a potting soil. And if you if you go shopping for potting soils, there are different types, of course, for the mm -hmm. house plants. So I've seen ones listed for, um, for example, African violets have their own type of mm -hmm. mix. And it, it depends on sort of how much soil and sand and other ingredients they have. Uh, mm -hmm. Things for cactus and succulents often have more sand and uh, lava rocks to make it a much lighter, fast draining soil. So, mm -hmm. so yeah. be careful with your choices because you do wanna get the, the right kind of soil for the plants that you're repotting or that you're putting into the in the container. You see any other questions, Jane? I don't see any other questions in the chat. Okay. Any other questions? Any other houseplant stories anyone wants to share? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to bring in my uh, Christmas cactus because as you and as Jane and I were talking about today, uh, the Christmas cactus for us doesn't usually bloom at Christmas, but sometimes it blooms through Christmas, but they they bloom more around Halloween for me. Mm -hmm. And I have several different colors, which is one of the wonderful benefits of the blooming houseplants is that you get the benefit of the, the flowers as well as the foliage. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I do well, have- There's a question I, there about flowering houseplants. Yeah. Yeah. So the Christmas cactus is one, um, like Yvonne said, um, and we shared this afternoon, mine's a Halloween, ha mine is a Halloween cactus because it's blooming now. Um, but there's also the peace lily um, that also does a nice white, um, beautiful white flower. And also, as we talked about the Chinese evergreen, um, of course, there's always African violets. Um, trying to think of some others that have, um, blossoms. Orchids, you can do orchids. They're a little bit, uh, yes. they can be fussy. Uh, they mm -hmm. like a little more humidity. So the, the trays underneath with the gravel is really helpful for a mm -hmm. lot of the orchids. But again, if you group them together, it helps mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. Orchids are fabulous and there are so many kinds and there are just like a lot of other plants, there are some that will tolerate more dry conditions versus more wet conditions mm -hmm. too. So right. I do better with things that need a little more dryness because I often forget to water. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and um, I know other people who have the opposite problem of watering too much. So you can definitely find the ones that work best for you. But there are some that are super easy, like the, the snake plant and the pathos. Those are, those are wonderfully easy to, to grow. Mm -hmm. And the Dracinia too, I had one of those that did really well for years. And I never repotted it. it it struggled along in its little original container for probably 10 years. It was fine. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
So if there's no other questions. All right. Well, I don't know, if, uh, Stefano, if you want to come back in, uh, just to thank everybody for coming today. And we really appreciate you coming to see us today and watch our program. Jane did a fabulous job telling us about all the benefits of house plants. I hope you'll get a few if you don't already have any. And come back and join us next month. Our program will be on tools. We also are doing our um, tool sharpening and tool care will be our topic for our food forum this month as well. So we've got a couple of options to learn more about garden tools. And the, the library talk for December will be on December 3rd, same time. So just register through our website, through the Master Gardener website. And um, the library is also posting the recording on their, uh, you have your own YouTube channel, correct? Right, we'll have it on our website as well. So once you you have it ready, I know you, you pass it on to us and we do get it on our website and it's available for people to look on our website. Um, and I do want to encourage people to come in and see the resources that we do have. Um, as Yvonne mentioned, um, we had been uh, on uh, limited services during um, right after COVID, and we've recently opened up again uh, to uh, provide more services and for more hours. We don't, you don't need an appointment right now. So Monday through Saturday, we're open from 10 until 5.30 and Sunday from one until 4.30. Um, we still have some restrictions as to how many people we can have in the building at one time, but it's opened up quite a bit more than it had been previously. Previously, it was by appointment only. And we're looking forward to hosting uh, on Thursday, December 3rd at seven, cool tools and great gifts for gardeners. And I'm looking forward to that one because I always have a hard time, you know, figuring out what yeah. I'm going to purchase for my husband for Christmas. So <laughs> we won't let him watch. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you everyone for coming today. And, and thanks for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. So thanks everybody. Bye -bye. Good night. Thank you.